Well, I'm really positive about the future, Jacob. So I would say to those of you who are listening, be positive. You know, there's enormous opportunities out there, but actually, you know, you need to grab them. You know, you need to become the person, the person you want to be. You you have to drive yourself towards that, towards that. But in doing so, be sure that you're also investing in your health. You're also investing yeah. in your learning, and you're also investing in your family and friends. Welcome everyone to another episode of The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. My guest today, Linda Gratton, Professor of Management Practice at London Business School and author. Uh, most recent book is The New Long Life, A Framework for Flourishing in a Changing World. Linda, thank you for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure, Jacob. Thank you for inviting me. Well, first, very obvious question for you is why did you write this book? Well, thanks, Jacob. Well, um, I've been studying uh, the future of work for more than a decade. In fact, I have this marvelous consortium of companies from all over the world who co-create with me. And I, I've written, I, I started off actually with a book called The Shift, which really said, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the things around us that are changing the way that we work? And I looked at, you know, all sorts of aspects, demography, uh, technology, and then um, Andrew Scott, who's a, a, a colleague of mine at the London Business School and, and an economist, he and I got to really talk about the future of work. In fact, we were doing a presentation in China. And um, what we realized is that the whole issue of demography just really hadn't been covered enough. You know, what happens when everybody lives to 100? And we wrote a book called The 100 Year mm. Life. And then we came back and said, but, but of course, demography isn't the only thing that's shaping organizations and shaping the way we live. It's also social change, you know, the way our families are structured. Yep. And indeed, it's technology. So we came back again. And The New Long Life basically says, you know, how should we live and be prepared to live in a world which is changing so profoundly. And of course, the book came out just as COVID hit. So it changed even more than we thought. Yeah, now my, my book came out uh, in March, like literally right when it was announced that everything was a pandemic and all the oh, madness yeah. was happening. So yeah. yeah, I know I know what it's like to have a book coming out right in the middle of a pandemic. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, the first question that I'm sure a lot of people are thinking of, um, are we gonna live to be 100 years old? Well, certainly every year we live longer and that's prime possibly in part because we live more healthily we know how to live more healthily and it's part because of all the extraordinary technologies that are helping us to live yeah. longer so yes right now uh, some of us and certainly our children could be prepared to live to 100 years old yeah yeah it's quite a interesting thought to think about living to 100 yeah. um which How yeah i mean I, I suppose for yourself jacob would you like to live what was 100? that would you like to live to 100 um yeah i mean assuming that that my wife and those around me can continue to live longer lives yes it's, it's sort of like that question that people always ask right if, if you could live forever would you yeah. and well if you could if you could live forever and everybody else around you ends up passing away that's kind of a depressing life yeah. so if i'm living to 100 and people around me can also live longer lives i'm all for that definitely yeah, yeah. um and so I, before we talk about what that means for work, I think it would be really important for people to get a little bit of context just around how work has changed. So, I mean, if we were to go back 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, we had one idea and assumption about work and one kind of social contract, and now it's changing. So can you talk a little bit about how that um, idea, that concept of work is shifting? Yeah, well, you know, in many ways, the, the way that we work was really began to be set by the industrial revolution. And at that stage, people moved from the fields into factories. And, and, and as such, they began to live what really was automated lives. You know, the factory started at eight o'clock, so they needed to be there at eight o'clock. 
uh, the factory closed, so they stayed until it was closed, and they did repetitive work. And interestingly, when we then, when more of our work was cognitive and we moved into offices, we replicated exactly the same aspects. You know, the idea that you could come in at a certain time, you left at a certain time. And because these were places where you, you went to work. And even though prior to the pandemic, we could work wherever we wanted to because of technologies, the truth was yeah. that most people didn't. They still went into the office and they still worked till nine to five. So then sort of nine to five office was really certainly how most cognitive work took place. And that had a couple of implications. One is it wasn't very flexible because it was nine to five and you're in an office. And in fact, it became a lot longer than nine to five because you know the technologies you carried, your iPhone and so on, meant that you could work a lot longer than five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and secondly, there was a whole sort of set of assumptions about what families did. And in many ways, oh. you know, the, the, as work developed in the 1950s and the 1960s, you know, you could probably earn enough uh, as a man to support your family. Um, but then a couple of things happened. One is that women went to university and became highly educated and wanted to work just as the way that men did. And secondly, a, a combination of factors meant that most families needed two incomes. And so women moved into the workforce and that also really changed the way things are, Jacob. So in many ways, pre the pandemic, we were really ready for change in my view. We needed, and this is really what we talked about in the new long life, that actually, you know, the way that technology was developed, the way that uh, our social fabric was developing, the way that we were aging and living longer, societies were aging, we were living longer, meant that we needed a new way of thinking about work. Yeah, and it's interesting because a lot of companies that um, did have flexible work programs, people, I think there was a little bit of a stigma around uh, taking advantage of flexible work programs. Where if your company offered it and you did it, people would say, oh, you know, so-and-so is not coming into the office or so-and-so is a little lazy. Yeah. Um, and now it's sort of, I mean, it's the, it's the standard. Everybody's working that way. So I think there's also been this really interesting shift in perception around what flexible work is and, and, and being able to use it, which I think has been great. My, my dad works in the aerospace industry and he has never in his entire life had a flexible work arrangement up until now wow. we're talking you know 50 plus years in the workforce never yeah. never had this idea of flexible work now all of a sudden he's working at home in his sweatpants <laughs> and i'm like dad th this is this is what i've been doing for for a long time now now you get to taste now, the now, now, you're, now, you're, now you and your dad are both in sweatpants jacob is that what you're saying pretty much pretty well, much I yeah i have to tell you yeah, i'm sitting here in what looks like pajamas, but is actually a very nice silk top, a very lovely velvet, and I only purchased these yesterday, velvet slippers. Oh my goodness. So there you are. You, Vel you know who else likes velvet? Velvet slippers. Is, uh, but actually, George, George Costanza from Seinfeld loves velvet. Oh yeah, I'm a big velvet fan. Um, so, velvet and silk. <laughs> So, uh, but the interesting thing about, about, about work, Jacob, is it isn't just about the day. What really came out from both the 100 year life and the new long life is a sort of fundamental restructuring of your working life. I mean, that for me was the big aha moment is that you mm. say, if you're going to live to 100 years, how long do you have to work? Well, I was lucky because I, I write with an economist so he could he could work that out in about four nanoseconds. The answer was late 70s. Um, and wow. then you, yes, I know. And then you said, well, hang, unless you saved a lot, which nobody does, um, unless you're in some countries, but mostly people don't. So, so then the question was, well, my God, how could you, somebody like your dad, or even you, Jacob, or particularly your dad, actually work like he's doing until he's 75, you know, 75. And that's when we began to realize, and it was a really yeah. fundamental insight for us, for Andrew Scott and I, is that this idea of the three-stage life, which was full-time education, full-time work, full-time retirement, was yeah. just not going to hold. And that's when we started talking about the multi-stage life, where you 
come in and out of each of those areas. So education, you come in and out of. Work, you come in and out of. Retirement, which we call leisure, you come in and out of. And then suddenly, you know, you get a whole lot of possibilities. And really the new long life was to, was to invite the reader, you the reader, to understand what could those possibilities be. And that was really exciting. Yeah. So instead of those um, kind of stages that you said, right, you go to school, you get a job, then you retire. Um, it seems like now it's all just kind of mushed together. You, you know, you, you might retire for a little bit, that you go back to school, in and out. So it's if, if it's not a linear path anymore, is it just what, like a bunch of just squiggles all over the place? Well, yeah, I mean, it is sort of a bunch of squiggles. And one of the things I, I teach a class at London Business School for second year MBA students, which is about the future of work. It's one of our most successful um, and popular electives, actually, because it turns out, Jacob, a lot of people want to know about the future of work. And one of the things yeah. I ask them to do there is to, given all we talk about, so we talk about, you know, technology, social trends, demographic trends, but also resource trends, you know, climate change and so on. And, and for the first half of the semester, that's what we talk about. And I get amazing people in to teach those topics. But then I say, well, knowing all you do about the world and how it's going to change, what does it mean for you and how the, the way that you manage your life? And then as part of the exam, I ask each one of them to write their life narrative. And what's really hmm. fascinating about that, Jacob, is how different they each are. So, you know, we, we use the concept I use in the book, in the book and indeed in my class, this concept of possible selves. You know, the idea that any point in time you could be something different. And the invitation really from the book and from the class is, what would that be? What would that different thing person be? And actually people had a lot of fun working out, you know, how do you build a life that's exciting, you know, and that's really, that was really the basis of the book because what we said, what we talked about in the new long life was saying, you know, if you want to actually build your own life, where you can't just simply look at everybody around you and say, well, what what are they doing? I need to do the same thing, which is what your dad would have done. I mean, your dad and my yep. dad, actually, they didn't really have to think about the transitions they were going through because everybody of the same age as them left college at the same time, went into you into into companies at the same time and are going to retire at the same time but actually once you break that three-stage life what you also break is the fact that everybody's doing the stuff at the same time so you've got to be much more cognizant of what it is you can be and that's why in the book we talk about three things we talk about narrative which is what is my life how am i going to narrate my life what is it the second is explore which is you know, if I could be many different things in my life, well, how do I find out what those are and how to give, give myself the resources that are able to do that? And then the third is relate, which was really about a topic I've come back to a lot in my books, which is families, communities, neighborhoods. You know, how do you strengthen those and how do you strengthen your connectivity? Yeah. And those three aspects of narrate, explore, relate became really the foundations for the whole book. So I thought we could talk a little bit more about those three, uh, those three areas, um, because I love how, that that's how you structured the book. So let's start off, um, so we have narrate, explore, relate. So for people who are listening or watching to this, uh, how can we walk them through this? So let's say you were, I don't know, everybody watching and listening is part of your MBA class and they're starting off with this uh, narrate yeah. section. Yeah. What's the, what's the action that they need to do? What should they be thinking about? Well, I'd say, you know, two things, uh, Jacob. The first is they need to think about, they need to realize that as they look forward, there are possible selves. And, and actually in the book, I, I'm, I'm a great scribbler. So in the book, you know, we've sort of scribbled <laughs> the idea that any point in time, the path in front of you could, you know, you could follow a number of different paths. And, and I think that's a mindset shift really the idea that at any point in time you could you could plan to be something different okay that's the first action so you know let your imagination go in terms of thinking about what what could it could i be 
The, the second action that comes from narrate is the idea that to do that, you need to build what we call in the book platforms, which is to say, so a platform is, think about it as a, sp as a springboard. That, that's the thing that you can jump off and spring off. And that platform, and it comes back to something we wrote about in the 100 year life, is made up of you know, the skills that you've got, uh, the social capital you have with regard to networks and so on. Um, and also your capacity to sort of move into action, to, to, to you know, to, to, to make things happen. Um, so those intangible assets, which actually, by the way, also include the, the, the money that you've got, your tangible assets, but your intangible assets, you know, your reputation, your brand, the skills you've got, the, the networks you've got, the friends you've got, they give you a platform that help you to explore the next stage of your life. And so, hmm. you know, that's why the second is about exploration, because if you want to, if, if I say to you, Jacob, you could from now on be three, have three different types of lives ahead of you, you'd have to say, well, how do I know if any of those are going to work for me? And that's, that's how we pretty naturally got onto the second piece, which was about exploration. So even before we jump to exploration, so um, when you think about these potential lives, yeah. uh, how, I, I mean, are these things that need to be related to what you're doing now? For example, I mean, maybe I want to say I want to be a chess player or an astronaut. Like how I, I, do they need to be tangentially related to the things that you're focusing on? Obviously, you're not just kind of randomly throwing things out there, right? But how do you make it something that's actually you know, that has some potential. I think, you know, and I, I don't think they're just about the jobs that you do. They're more about your ways of living. So, okay. you know, I, one of the things I do is I, I help companies think about the future of work. And I, I often, to help them do that, help them build what I call a persona. And a persona is a total description of somebody's life. It isn't just about what job, but, you know, how would you relate to your family you know what what, what what's your family yeah. situation like I mean how are you spending your time so so in a way what you could think about is rather than thinking about it as 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 individual jobs but rather to say what's the persona that you could use to describe who you who you would who you could be or who you would like to hmm. be and so it might be that, uh, so, so and we give in the book quite a lot of examples of this. So, for example, what, one of the, the people we talk about is a Japanese, uh, a relatively young Japanese guy. And, and the reason we use that, by the way, is that my books, um, the, major, the, the, the major market for my books is Japan, which is sort of extraordinary, really, but it is. Our last wow. book, 100 Year Life, became the best-selling book in Japan. It was made into a manga. And so... We wanted to help Japanese people think about well, how did you how do you get away from your parents' expectations? Because if you're if you're a 30 year old in Japan, your parental expectations weigh very heavily on you. And so the question we we asked of this this character in the in the book was, how could you imagine another way an, a, another thing that you could be? And, hmm. and 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 then and then the question is, what would it take for you to explore what that other th piece could be, which then leads to the sort of second major, well, the third major action about narrative, which is about transitions, which is to say, how do you manage the transitions from where you are now to what you could or would be want to be in the future? And, and what we've learned about transitions is they take a very um, predictable sequence. And the sequence is, in terms of transitions, that you, you begin to to think about being something different than you are now. And you do that uh, by going into actually exploring that possible self. Let's say, for example, Jacob, you say, I'd really like to be an entrepreneur next. You know, really start, really build my own business. Well, you know, one thing you do is you'd start changing your network. So you'd spend more time with other entrepreneurs. So you learnt how they uh, interact. And then you'd start you know, using 
and their identity. So when people said to you, Jacob, what do you do? You'd say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I build businesses. So your identity changes and your networks change. And, and that's a really important part of your narrative, because in the end, how you describe yourself to, to yourself is, is, is what, you know, what do you tell others about who you are? And, and how does your network and friendships, how does that also shape who you are and who you become? And so you start then moving, you know, into side, you, you know, you do projects that allow you to almost pretend to be an entrepreneur and say, well, how does that feel? So it isn't that you suddenly change yourself. It's rather that you realize through the, this power of narrative that you could be something different. You don't have to be what your parents want you to be or what you think society wants you to be. You have an ex you have a possibility, particularly at this time in the history of the world, to become a social, you know, to, to, to actually to, 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 to narrate a different way of being, you know. And we use it in the book, you know, we talk about how important it, this process of reinvention is and how important it is for you to be sort of ingenious, really, about what you could be to actually explore um, the various options that you have in front of you. And, and that, for me, is one of the most exciting aspects about where we are now, is that we do have an opportunity to explore what we want to be and to change our narrative. My mom actually went through a... I'd say a process of reinvention because she used to be a computer programmer. And then she, I, I remember her coming home from work many, many nights. She was just so unhappy with her job. She was crying and she was very, very upset. And finally my dad was like, look, there's no amount of, of money is worth this level of stress and unhappiness. And so she went back to school and she became a marriage and family therapist. Oh. So she, in the middle of her life made a, made a career, a pivot change. Yeah. Uh, from being a computer programmer to a therapist. And I've actually talked to a lot of people, even here in the Bay Area. One lady who used to have a mobile dog grooming service, she used to um, mm -hmm. come come to our house and uh, shave our little dogs, started talking to her one day and say, how, you know, how'd you get into this? And she said, well, I used to be a, a high-level corporate attorney. Wow. And she went from being a corporate attorney to having a mobile dog grooming service. And I was just like, Wow. And so many times when I talk to entrepreneurs, whether they have pastry shops or whether they are, you know, creating products or services, they they have done different things. And it's just so fascinating to see yeah. these pivots that people have had. Yeah. I've even talked to Uber drivers yeah. um, in the Bay Area and start talking to them and they say, oh, yeah, you know, I used to be a, a program manager or I used to be a, a leader at this company and it was, it was too much. Now I'm building my own business and I'm driving on the side. So it's the stories that people yeah. have is just really fascinating. Sort of, well, well, actually, Jacob, those the stories you've told have a lot of resonance to the sort of research that we've done about about how people change. So one is the side hustle. You know, very often yeah. when people are in transitions, the side hustle provides them with with cash, but also maybe opportunities to to explore what that might be like. And the second is about, you know, you talked about your mum and dad, and it was your dad who said to your mum, you know, we need to think about this. And, and, and the third area that I talk about, which is relate, really is about this, because very often when we've talked about people's lives, we've somehow seen them as being completely independent or autonomous from their family structures. But most of us are in some sort of a family structure, and certainly when I teach my MBAs, one of the things they're thinking about is they're saying, well, in fact, some of them have already been in situations where their, their, their partner has said to them, you do the MBA, I work, and, 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 I'll, and then you know, we, we'll swap as it were. So very often you see that when people are doing, uh, thinking about their, their, their futures, they're not thinking about themselves as an individual they're actually thinking of themselves within a partnership. And I feel that we've really got to acknowledge that and also acknowledge the mm. fact that women um, are playing a very crucial role in those partnerships. And, yeah. uh, and one of the things that I've talked about quite a lot through my own writing, Jacob, is just how important it is um, 
for men to step up within within the family and that's that's uh that's been a recurring theme and it actually comes out in the new long life as well which is to say how can we you know if if you going if you say you're going if you think you're going to live to 100 and uh you're only going to have let's say two kids and they're only yep. going to be you know young for maybe 5 years that's a very small proportion of your whole life you know and one of the things yeah. i'm saying to dads in the book and as i talk about the book is you know you could easily reallocate time so one of the aspects of the, the chapter on narrative is the reallocation of time you know if you have a multi-stage life then it means that the time that you would have retired you can now think about that and move it forward you know why don't so if you spent two years let's say uh doing a job where you could spend more time with your kids that's a wonderful thing to do and you know it builds an asset a family asset that is really really important to you going forward you know you're more likely to have a better relationship with your children right the way through the whole of your life so yeah. part of what we've said about the narrative of your life is don't just think about where you are now think about you know what would your 80 year old self ask of you Ooh. I, you know and I, and i guess that you know one of the things that your 80 year old self might say to you as as a, as a dad is I wish you spent more time with the kids when they were young because that was a very short period of time which you'll never get back again. And part of what we talk about in narrate is things that happen, you know, things you can do over and over again like, you know, working really hard. You can honestly do that at any time in your life. Looking after, uh, you know, a, a kid when they're one year old, well, <laughs> you've only got one year to do that. It doesn't happen again. So, these are sort of like really important mm. questions that where we we ask people really to think about through the book but also through the teaching we do at London Business School I have a 9 month old and a 4 oh, and a half year old and sometimes e yeah sometimes even I struggle with that it's like uh and especially as an entrepreneur my wife and I are both entrepreneurs and sometimes there's this should I answer that last email or or close the computer and spend time with the kids and we I like to think we do a pretty good job of you know, at the end of each day, we try to put things away and spend time with our kids. And we're constantly, if, if we're not doing that, either I'll remind my wife or she'll remind me and she'll say, hey, close the computer, time for family. Yeah. But it's it's hard. Um, you know, we're constantly distracted by technology and pulled in so many different directions. So I, I love that um, visual of um, giving your 80-year-old self, you know, asking what they would want. Because you're right. I mean, when I think of my 80-year-old self, my 80 year old self isn't going to say, Hey, are you glad you responded to that email? Um, no, it's probably going to be exactly like you said. Did you spend more time with your kids and have fun with them? But, but, you so know, the other thing is it's, it, I didn't mean in the book or even in, in our, my conversation with, with you, Jake, to, to really, you know, to say to people, this is an easy thing because it, it you know, I'm, I've, I have children of my own. Um, and I know how, how tough it is, but I think, one thing that you've just talked about, Jacob, now, which is really important, is that you and your wife talked about it in the sense that you were thoughtful. And, and I think that that's, mm. that's all we can ask of ourselves. And, and, and in the program I do at London Business School with my MBA students, you know, th the request from me is not that they live, you know, the life that I think they should live in terms of multi-stage but actually that they look at their options and they look at their consequences. And, and that's you know, in terms of narrative, this this idea of options and consequences is really, really important. And of course, yeah. you know, there will be times when you have to work really hard, but there are consequences to that. Um, and in terms of your relationship with your kids and your relationship to yourself and your, your relationship to others. So helping them frame in terms of options, options and consequences. The, the other thing we talked about, not so much in the new long life, but in the hundred year life, is the idea that these intangible assets in in the in the website for the for the hundred year life there's a you can go in and fill in a, 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 a survey which tells you what your intangible assets are at any point in time and i get my mba students to do that in fact you know anyone can do it it, sit, it sits there for free but what's really interesting about that is to say look 
it's okay if at, at a, a certain point in your ta- in your life you realize that you're letting things go that that's okay but just don't let it continue too long you know that's the point really mm. you, you know when i yeah. when i wrote the 100 year life and uh, and then the new long life and asked myself what would my 80 year old self say to me right now what my 80 year old would your old self would say you need to get more healthy you've absolutely mm. got i mean jacob you look like the master of healthy living so i can see that we try that, my wife and i that's um kind of exactly like you said cuz uh um you know, we, we try to eat healthy. We try to exercise. We both had family members and friends who've, you know, passed away earlier than they should have because they weren't yeah. being healthy. I'm constantly trying to get my dad to eat healthy. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's health is like the number one thing, right? It's, um, it really is. And that's, you know, so when people have said to me, Linda, what did you change? The most, the most drastic thing that I changed is I started to do Pilates seriously uh, mm. I lost weight and I walked for six six kilometers a day. I didn't today because A, it's wow. raining and B, I've been on webinars all day. Starting with Australia <laughs> this morning, 12 hours ago. So, oh my yeah, goodness. it's been a long day. Um, but I, I prefer to package things together. This is my own way. Of, uh, and then so Friday, for example, I, I'm, I'm not doing anything. So I'd rather yeah. just go straight through and and then and then take time out but that was that was a really big big takeaway for me and and by the way you know one of the reasons that the, the narrate the section in the book is a lot about the way that you use time and you know staying healthy is very time consuming you know wouldn't it be great if we could just eat a pill and be healthy but actually you know walking six kilometers a day takes me because i'm really slow more than an hour uh preparing nutritious food is very time consuming so yeah you're setting aside i probably set aside two hours a day to stay healthy so that's a lot about but the good news is if i live to 100 i've got plenty of time you know so yeah <laughs> i have got plenty of time i've got many hours ahead of me to stay healthy yeah well um I know we spent a lot of time talking about narrate, yeah. so maybe we could touch on um, the last two, which are explore yeah. and relate. I'm assuming explore is actually taking steps to do those things. Like you said, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you change your network. If you want to um, switch careers, you enroll in those programs, right? Is it more about taking those steps? Yeah, it is. It is a lot about that. But it's actually also about learning. Um, one of the areas that I think about and write about quite a lot is 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 skills and the development of skills and you know jacob one of the aspects of our lives is that technology and we talk about this quite a lot in the book technology will change the jobs that we do and um, yeah i don't i'm not an advocate of saying that all our jobs will disappear and technology will destroy all our jobs they won't but what technology will do and that would be robotics or artificial intelligence machine learning is that it will, they will, it will um, substitute for the tasks, some of the tasks that we do. And in some cases, in some jobs, they substitute for a lot of the tasks. And in other jobs, yeah. they substitute for some of the tasks. But all of us, will, our jobs will change. And, and that will accelerate over time. So that means that we have to be always sort of one step ahead of technology and that's why explore is so important because explore has in my view two aspects to it one is the future view which is to say what where should i place my bets you know what what are some of the jobs i think are going to grow and some of the jobs i think are going to go you know will 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 be affected by technology a great deal and secondly what are the sort of skills i've got to do so that's the sort of the foresight part of exploration and then secondly how do i learn these skills you know how do i give myself time to do that and in a multi-stage life as i described earlier um you have to put time aside to either upskill so that in your current mm -hmm. job you learn new things in your current job or to reskill where you you actually learn something completely different 
And we have to do that right the way through our lives because if we don't, you know, one of the other things that your 80 year old self, well, no, your 60 year old self is going to say to you, Jacob, is why didn't you carry on learning? Because I'm now 60 years old. I desperately want to carry on working and nobody will give me a job because I haven't got the right skills. Yeah. So that's the other thing. I don't think your 80 year old will say that to you, but your 60 year old self will. And the reason they'll say it to you is right now, if you're 60 years old and you lose your job, it's really difficult to get another job. Really. Oh yeah. And so you've got to be always moving forward. So the question of how do you learn becomes really important. And, and I have to say, and you sit in the Bay Area, I'm very optimistic about that because right across the Bay Area, in fact, I'm doing something tomorrow with uh, a whole bunch of people in the Bay Area, you know, you are <laughs> investing in learning technologies. I mean, there's some amazing businesses being built at the moment who do extraordinary things to credentialize learning, to, you know, modulate um, uh, programs so that people, people can learn amazing stuff that helps you to understand what's happening in the labor market, that connects you to jobs. I mean, this is going, technology will play an enormously important role in the labor market and in the flexible labor market. So I feel very excited about what's coming down the, the line in terms of digital learning, in terms of uh, you know, the landscape of skills in terms of how you you develop yeah. yourself. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the theme of perpetual learning is something that even I've talked about for a while. I use my dad as an example because he was an immigrant from the Republic of Georgia. And uh, when he came to America, he didn't speak any English and he learned how to speak English by watching uh, the Johnny Carson and Merv Griffin shows with a English to Russian translation dictionary. Wow. So he's constantly, and he still has that dictionary that he, um, that he keeps at his desk. So whenever he hears a new word, he, he looks it up. And, you know, I hear stories like that of people who had to learn new things. There was no YouTube, there was no technology. Like you're, it's like, how do you even learn in that kind of an environment? And today we have access to so many tools and resources. Yeah. You could learn anything, literally anything that you can think of by just, typing it into a browser. So there's really no excuse for why you can't be leveling up um, constantly. It's sort of like um, like a video game or thinking of yourself as like an app on your phone or the apps on your phone, they constantly get updates, right? Every, every week or every month, there's a feature update, a bug fix. And we need to think of ourselves as apps as well. We have to update ourselves on a regular basis. And um, sometimes we assume that whatever you learned in school is going to last with you forever. And if you need to learn something new, your company is going to teach it to you. But we need, you talk about this in your book, more agency, more accountability, more responsibility. And uh, I, I think that's a very, very important message for people to remember because we, I think a lot of people just assume that um, if you need to learn something, it'll come your way instead of you going after it. Yeah, it's a much more proactive way of thinking about yeah. it. But actually, you know, one of the things we've done in the book is we build a, a series of, of personas, you know, and say what, what would happen to this person. And one of the personas I build is um, a woman who's a single mom, got a couple of kids, really trying to make things work, you know, uh, working, doing three jobs, which of course is very common in the US. And I asked my MBA students, if you were her, what would you do now? That's, a, that's an old philosophy story, actually. What, what, what could she do? And that's really important for agency, Jacob, because one of the things that we have to remember is agency is really easy for you and I. Um, your dad was sounded like an amazing, an amazing person. But actually, you know, the Uber driver that you that you met, um, they probably work really long hours on zero contracts. And so we have to and this is actually, you know, the work that I'm doing now, particularly for the World Economic Forum, where I serve as a as a co-chair of one of their councils, is about inequality in these sorts of opportunities. And so, you know, it isn't enough, I don't think, for me as an MBA, an MBA teacher, an MBA professor to say to help just help my MBA students because honestly, Jacob, they really don't need me to help them. They're already at London Business School or Stanford or Harvard. They're, they're, they're gonna be just fine. It's actually the guy you spoke to, the Uber driver that needs our help. And so one of the bigger questions I think we're facing, which we address 
later on in the book when we talk about what should governments do, particularly, is governments have to play a role here to help your Uber driver. You know, who's going to pay for your Uber driver to be upskilled and reskilled? He, he's working really long hours already. Um, so the safety nets are become really important. And we haven't spoken about the pandemic, but, the, you know, the pandemic yeah. is making that even more importantly. So I suppose for me, you know, part of the story of the new long life isn't just the story of people who are fortunate, but it's also the story of people who have a more difficult time of it and how do they upskill and reskill. And I think one of the, there's the couple of things that I find really exciting about this. One is that quite a lot of the digital stuff that helps them upskill and reskill is either free or it's very low cost. And that's, you know, that's really wonderful that, that they have those opportunities. And I think the second thing is that, um, you know, governments are beginning to realize they have a role to play here to, 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 to help to help people who haven't had some of the opportunities that you and I have had. So I think that's a really important part of the new long life. It isn't just about MBA students and, and Jacob Morgan and Linda Grattan. It's actually about a whole bunch of people who... You'll yeah. find these transitions a lot more difficult. Well, maybe in our last few minutes, we can talk about uh, the last one, which is relate uh, as the final stage in there. So can you give a little bit of context around um, that stage? Yeah, well, so relate is really about your relationships with other people. Um, I think, you know, when people have looked at books about, you know, how to manage my career or whatever, they, they tend to look at the individual as, as if they were completely autonomous, you know, as if they would, it was just their career. But actually, for most of us, you know, our life is led in with others around us, you know, be that the people, be our, you know, our parents, you've talked about your mum and dad, be our, our children, our partners, our very closest friends. And the relationships with them is a really important part of the new long life. And, you know, we, we start off one of, the, one of the parts of that book with a, a very old piece of research, but I, I absolutely love it, which was the Harvard research that followed a group of people right the way through their lives, you know, beginning to end, well, well from going to university right the way through. And one of the questions they asked was, if you saw their whole life, what... What aspects of their life would help you to predict their feelings of happiness and satisfaction later on in their lives? And, 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 and what they found is that money was important. So anybody who says, you know, it's great to be poor, it, it's not, because being poor reduces your options. And actually, a great life is about having options. But, but of course, what they found with money is that after a certain, uh, pit tar, uh, a certain amount of money, having more doesn't necessarily make you more, either more happy or more satisfied. So that was the first thing they found, which actually is a big point, I think, for MBA students, because quite often they're thinking, if only I could become a billionaire or a millionaire, then it, it would be amazing. Um, it might be amazing, but it actually might not. But what really made a difference to, their lot, to the quality of their life right the way through, particularly in the later stages of their life, was their friendships. And so, mm. you know, in Relate, we talk a lot about, you know, the, the nature of friendships, the nature of families and how they need time. You know, again, I think, Jacob, through this conversation, we're going back to this notion of the allocation of time. You know, you're not going to be able to build a great relationship with your family or a great relationship with your friends unless you give them time. And the marvelous mm. thing about the 100 year life is you have a lot of time. There's a lot of hours. So the question is, how do you allocate your hours? And giving yourself time with your friends is enormously important. And that's what that was the big insight from the Harvard case was that actually the people who were happiest and most satisfied in their lives were people who had great friends. And, and I talked to my MBA group about my friend Shirley. So when I was 10 years old, Shirley and I were in the same school together. And we're now 66. So we've had 50 years, more than 50 years of friendship. And actually, that's an enormously precious 
gift to me. You know, like I can talk to Shirley and she reminds me of, you know, the, the first person I kissed. I'd sort of forgotten that. Shirley can tell you who it was. <laughs> Or and we were having we were having supper together a couple of years ago, and the people from the next door came to our table as they were leaving. They said, "They said we hope you don't mind us saying this, but we've never seen two people have so much fun together." <laughs> ah, sounds like we need to have Shirley on this podcast oh, one of these days. Oh, you should have Shirley. She's amazing. <laughs> Shirley's amazing. And you know, she, she our lives took, took different paths. She actually moved to the states and you know worked in the states for years, but but nevertheless. That, and the point I make, and you can imagine the point I make to my MBA students is, you could be the richest person in the world yeah. and not have Shirley. And uh, and that's really the point. And you can't buy Shirley. I mean, I know I'm not the first p p person to make the question what money can buy, but Shirley cannot be bought. And my relationship with Shirley can't be bought. So that's a really important it, it, you know, point, particularly for people like maybe the, those who are listening to your podcast or my MBA students, where, you know, money does, you know, you can think that if only, if only I could do X, then I could be happy. And, and actually, I'm not suggesting that, you know, making money isn't a wonderful thing. You know, I'm very fortunate. I made money. I, had a, I have a wonderful life. But actually, that's never going to be enough. Um, and, and actually mm. giving yourself time and in, to invest in other parts of your life, in the way that you learn, in the way re you relate to your kids, in the way that you um, relate uh, to, your, to your family and friends is just an enormously important investment. And I'm sure that when my 80-year-old self talks to me, if I was talking to my 80-year-old self, they would, they would say to me, thank goodness you've stayed friends with Shirley because we've now known yeah. each other for 70 years. Wow. Um, well, to wrap up, I know we only have a couple of minutes left. Maybe we could end on some some advice for people who are watching or listening to this, uh, what they should know as far as how to live and how to work in this new world where we're potentially living to 100 years old, where we potentially have to reinvent ourselves many times. What What should we do? Well, I'm really positive about the future, Jacob. So I would say to those of you who are listening, be positive. You know, there's enormous opportunities out there. But actually, you, know, you need to grab them. You know, you need to become the person, the person you want to be. You, you have to drive yourself towards that, towards that. But in doing so, be sure that you're also investing in your health. You're also investing yeah. in your learning and you're also investing in your family and friends. Yeah, I love that advice. Don't, uh, sometimes we forget about the things in life that really matter. So I, I love the message um, to, to not forget about those things. Well, Linda, where can people go to learn more about you, your book, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? Okay. Well, obviously there's, there's my mother's new book, the uh, new long life and the hundred year life, both of which you can get in any store. Um, but they've also, you can also listen to them. So if you prefer listening books, which actually I must say I do, uh, you, can, <laughs> you can listen, you can download them and you can listen to them. Um, my website, www.lindagratton.com is, is actually at this moment being redesigned. It's still there, it looks great, but it's gonna be even better. And in it, you can, see, <laughs> um, you can click on to almost everything I've ever written. So we've, we've, we're spending a bit of time, it, it's it's will be ready by uh May, april 20 where are we 2021 yeah so if you're listening after april it's already ready go and have a look at it it's fabulous and the consulting practice i i i i, I run is called hsm so you can if you go to uh hsm then you'll find it there and the best way really is to connect to me on linkedin I have a very active LinkedIn profile and a very active Twitter profile. LinkedIn and Twitter, yeah. very good. Well, Linda, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me today. It was a lot of fun speaking with you. Great, thank you so much, Jacob. Lovely to speak with you. Likewise, and thanks everyone again for tuning in. My guest again has been Linda Gratton. Make sure to check out her book. Again, it is called The New Long Life a framework for flourishing in a changing world. And I will see all of you next time.
Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want more content just like this, then please remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, my new book, The Future Leader, where I interviewed over 140 of the world's top CEOs and surveyed nearly 14,000 employees in partnership with LinkedIn is now available. You can grab a copy for yourself and your team at getfutureleaderbook.com.